Welcome to Sunday School at St. Luke's. Hello everyone and welcome. Uh, let's just sign in and then sanitize. Rub, rub, rub. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Get all nice and clean. Now, if you were here last week, you will have seen that I had completely forgotten to do something rather important down in this room down here, which is near the altar. And this room we call uh, the vestry. There's two vestries in the church. There's the choir vestry all the way at the back there. And there's this one that we call the vicar's vestry. And if you remember last week, I was suddenly reminded that it had been covered in cobwebs that I'd promised to do something about. Well, I did manage to keep my promise. And here we are. We are okay. And everything is cleaned up i managed to do in here as well still not the nicest of places maybe and we could do with uh tidying things up still but there we go and out we pop into the main body of the church it's not nice is it when we let people down i'm sure we've all had a time in our lives when we have been told this is your last chance. It might be going out somewhere, maybe to a party or to some sort of event, maybe the cinema or a, or, a, or the theatre in, in times when we aren't locked down. Um, and if we miss it, if we're too late out of the door, then that's it. No one's going to hold the show for you. No one's going to stop the movie. And if you have missed it, then that really was your last chance. And that is it. And the chance is then gone. Perhaps we've been told that this is our last chance about something rather more serious. The sad thing is that one day it really will be our last chance to do something. Let's learn what Jesus has been talking about with our reading today. Okay, let's head down to the front of church. Up there is the lectern. And on the lectern is the Bible. And for today's reading, Sunday the 4th of October, we're looking at Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 to the end of that chapter. Hello children, today's readings are from Matthew. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to the tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the, owners of the, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches, wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. 
When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. Well, there's an awful lot to unpick from that reading, isn't there? Jesus is using two stories in one, really. The first story, he's talking again about a vineyard, and we'll come to that a little bit later. But in the second part of the story, Jesus refers to himself as the cornerstone, or the keystone. And I thought I'd show you one to show you what he means. Here it is. This is an archway, and it's a very, very strong structure, which is just as well, because in a moment I'm going to be underneath it, and of course I don't want to be crushed by a whole load of falling stone. That would make a rather tragic Sunday school video, wouldn't it? Well, here's the cornerstone or the keystone just there. It's the middle point in this archway. All of the stones are basically pushing against this one, which holds the structure up. It makes it really, really strong. You go out and have a walk along the canal or walk along the river, the River Loon, uh, just before and below Halton, and you'll see bridges with this sort of structure in them. And the reason for that is it's incredibly strong. It can hold up tons and tons and tons of material above it, all because of this one stone in the middle. Everything is pushing onto this one here, and it is holding everything up, just like Jesus holds everything together. It is Jesus who allows us to enter the kingdom of heaven. Without Jesus, it would all fall apart. This arched structure is very strong, but it's only strong because right in the middle of the archway, all of the other stones rest against the one and only keystone. They're held in place by it. Jesus says that he is the keystone or cornerstone of our lives. And if we build our lives according to his word, then we too will stand strongly forever. But if we remove the keystone from our lives, then just like this building, everything else would come crumbling down. Look at these. Grapes. Even now, when we have so many different sorts of fruits from all over the world, grapes are really something special, aren't they? Do you like grapes? You must do. They're sweet. They're delicious. These days, of course, you can buy them without any seeds in them. So nice for a little early evening tea. Absolutely delicious. And back 2,000 years ago in Israel, grapes were considered one of the most incredible, delicate and wonderful fruits that there were. And grapes are grown in a very special type of farm called a vineyard. And grapes aren't the easiest thing to grow. Now I prefer sometimes gooseberries because gooseberries are quite easy to grow and you can make a gooseberry crumble very nicely. I've yet to try to make a grape crumble but I can't imagine it would be quite the same. Mind you, there's one or two other good, rather good things that you can do with grapes that you can't necessarily do quite so well with a gooseberry and they're not as thorny to pick. To grow grapes well you have to devote a lot of time and effort to growing a grape vine. Lots of grape vines don't particularly bear very good fruit and so when you have one that does you've got to look after it and nurture it and care for it all year long in order to get a lovely bunch of grapes at the end. The Israelites knew this. They knew how much care and effort and attention needed to be given to a grapevine in order for it to bear the greatest fruit. And the Israelites thought that they might be that good fruit, that God was the farmer who tended their grapevine and that they were going to be the really special fruit that God has, had grown. Jesus knew this. And whenever he used the idea of a vineyard, he was throwing that idea back at the chief priests and the elders. That's why he uses so many vineyard ideas in his parables. And if you've listened to all of these stories over the last few weeks, you must think that being a vineyard owner is a really tough gig. 
first of all we have the vineyard owner who goes out and employs different people at different times of the day agrees with all of them what the wage should be and then at the end of the day when people discover how much each other have been paid they get all grumbly about it then we have the vineyard owner who tells one of his sons to do something that son says yes of course i will and then doesn't and the other son who says no i'm not going to do that but then does and now we've got the parable of the vineyard owner who plants this amazing farm, this wonderful place, puts everything in it that anybody could need, goes off and allows some people to come in and they can farm it on the understanding that they'll produce and give some of the grapes, the crops to the vineyard owner at the end of the year. When the vineyard owner sends his uh, servants out to collect that debt, Instead of being grateful and instead of just paying their debt like they should have done, the people who've been working on the vineyard instead torture and even kill some of those people who've been sent to collect the debt. So the vineyard owner says, well, I'll send out my son to them instead. They won't do anything to him and they'll understand how important he is to me. Well, instead of doing the right thing and paying back some of that uh, debt, Instead, the people who are living on the uh, vineyard farm, they do exactly the same thing to the farmer's son. They take the farmer's son and they kill him. Who do you think that Jesus is referring to as the son in this story? Yes, I think so too. Jesus is referring to himself, God's son. Even though Jesus was telling the story before his own arrest and execution, he knew just what was going to happen and just as the man in the story sent his son to collect what was due, many of the people of Israel also rejected Jesus' teaching, had him arrested and killed. Now at the end of that parable, the landowner removes the tenants from his farm and allows other different people to come in and settle the land. In this story, Jesus is telling everyone there that the world and heaven and God's law has been given not to just a small group of people, but to anyone who will hear and obey the word of God. And that includes people like you and me. So long as we listen to and obey Jesus, we inherit the kingdom of heaven too. Today's activity isn't so much let's get crafty as let's get messy because today we're going to make a very messy, splattery, painty bunch of grapes made using our hands to make the different parts of the grapes. So this is what you'll need. You'll need a piece of A3 paper and I would suggest that you're going to get quite messy so you're going to need to put some other paper underneath or at least be prepared to do lots and lots of good cleaning. You're also going to need a big plate, three smaller plates or saucers, a biro and a felt tip pen and you're going to need some different coloured paints. You're going to need purple, you're going to need green, and you're going to need brown paint. I couldn't find any brown paint, so I'm going to make my own. And to do that, you need some red paint, some blue paint, and some yellow paint. So we'll make that first. With one of your saucers, don't worry anyone who recognises these, I'm going to wash it later on, you take Splodge of your red paint, you only need a little bit of brown so don't waste too much paint, you need a splodge of yellow paint, and a splodge of blue. You might need to do a bit of experimenting to find out how much of each you need. Now, get something that you can mix your paint with. You 
This will do. And work away at it. Mix, 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 mix. And you'll see all those colours blend into each other to make a rather fetching shade of brown. That's looking a little too red for my taste, so I'm going to add a touch more blue. There we go, we're getting a darker shade of brown now. And that's going to be good enough for my stem. Now you've got your brown paint and some clean hands, you need to put your other paints on some saucers as well. They need to be fairly decently sized saucers because you're going to be applying various parts of your hand to them in order to make our plant. We need some green paint to be a leaf. That would be enough, I should think. And some purple paint for our grapes. My favourite types of grapes are the red or the purple variety. So there we go, plenty of purple paint there. So I've got brown, I've got green, I've got purple. Now, a piece of A3 paper and another large plate. I'm going to draw a circle around my plate and I'm going to draw it in pen or maybe pencil would be even better because I'm going to draw it very, very finely for now. And I'll show you why in a second. Now hopefully my bunch of grapes are going to fit inside that circle. Now in order to make grapes we need sunlight and to turn sunlight into grapes we need leaves. And leaves are big and green. I wonder what we've got that's big and vaguely leaf shaped that we could coat in green hands. So get your saucer and apply lots of green paint. You could use a paintbrush or just, let's face it, we're going to be nice and messy. Just get plenty of green paint on your hand. There we go. Look at that. Absolutely fantastic. There's a leaf and it's going to go down splodge right in the middle of our circle. There you go. Of course it's a leaf. Now, the next thing that we need, as well as a leaf, is a stem. What colour are stems? That's right, brown. Get your brown paint and apply it to the side of your hand, the, the bit that isn't particularly covered in green. This is a messy activity, ladies and gentlemen. There we go, we have a nice brown stem which I'm going to apply. I think it's going to look nice if I went across here. And I'm going to bend upwards ever so slightly. There we go. There's my stem. Now, unfortunately, in the interest of artistic credibility, I need to go and wash my hands now because I'm going to start applying grapes and I need a nice clean thumb for that. Now the grapes. Purple paint for purple grapes and a thumb. There we are, one thumb, around about grape size, and bunches of grapes go from most at the top to least at the bottom. So I'm going to put a splodge there. There's one of my grapes, and I'm just going to keep splodging, splodge, 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 splodge. I'll do a couple more splodges on this. Top bunch, splodge, splodge. Next row down, splodge, 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 splodge. Don't let them run into each other too much because you want to see the vaguely round outline of each one. Splodge. Splodge. And we'll just have a couple at the bottom. Splodge, splodge, splodge. And one hanging out of our circle, splodge. There we are, a bunch of grapes. Now that's our, that's our bunch of grapes. Looks all right, sort of. Um, but I thought I might just try to finish it off a little bit and add a few other little bits and pieces from our story. 
So I'm going to imagine that the top, the curve of our circle uh, could be the top of an archway. So I'm going to draw faintly with my pen or pencil a few things to look a little bit like stones. They're going behind my grapevine. Just following the curve of my circle to look a bit like an archway. Same on this side. If you've got a bit of time or more artistic license and skill than I have, you could possibly try to colour them so they look a bit like stones. There we are. Just going down. my leaf and then I'm going to take my felt pen and I'm just going to accentuate that and of course the most important of all of these stones here is this middle one the keystone or the cornerstone just as in our reading Jesus says he is the keystone to our lives here is a keystone holding up our arch so when you've done this activity at this and you'll see the keystone up there and you'll understand that Jesus is the keystone of our lives and you'll remember the story of the wicked tenants of the vineyard. Once everything has dried what you might want to do is cut it out with some scissors and you've got something nice that you could, I don't like to say hang on your wall but you can keep somewhere to remind you of this Sunday school. Now for our prayers. So let's put our hands together and close our eyes and Jill will lead us in prayer. And now it's prayer time children. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so patient with us. Forgive us when we turn away from you. Help us to listen to your Son, Jesus, and follow him. Amen. The love of Jesus fill us. The Holy Spirit guide us. Will of the Father be done. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen. Well, thank you everybody. There's another Sunday School done and dusted and I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Everything looks shipshape here, so let's head on over to church and say our usual goodbyes to people and, uh, and then we'll go... Oh, hello, virtual vicar. Did you want me for something? Oh, you want me to follow you? Okay, okay. I haven't forgotten to do something again, have I? No? Oh, good, good, good. Oh, right, okay, okay. Ooh. This is uh, strangely familiar. Okay. Oh, dear. Yes, well, yes. Must be very careful. Okay, I'm to follow you. All right, then. Hmm. Looks like somebody forgot to put in the top floor windows. Okay. Ah, ah, oh, uh, oh, right, I'm to go. Okay, okay. Oh, and, okay. Right. So, I just go through here, do I? Okay, oh, oh, this is, hello, this is a bit different. What's going on here? Hello, who are you? Oh, you are virtual Vinter, I see. I'm in a vineyard. And what have we got here? Oh, are these the cases of our various vintages? What have we got here? Chateau Close 2020. Okay. Chateau Avenue 2020. How very parochial these are. Chateau Rue 2020. And what's it? Oh, I see. The, uh, the top quality brand. 
the vintage. Look at that. And uh, what's this one over here? Ah, our non-alcoholic variety. I see. Fantastic. And what have we got over here? We've got our we've got our wine press. Fantastic. And all these wonderful vines. Absolutely marvellous. So why have we done this virtual vicar? Oh, I see. It saves on communion wine costs. What a fantastic idea. Amazing. Well, thank you very much, Virtual Vicar. And thank you very much, Virtual Vinter, for looking after our amazing vineyards. I think it's probably time to go. So, let's say goodbye, everybody. And we will see you again soon. Bye-bye, Virtual Vinter. Bye-bye, Virtual Vicar. Bye-bye, everybody. Stay safe. Bye!